Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Christian O'Neill. I'm going to give a presentation today on substance use disorders, neurophysiology, behavior, and epidemiology. So a good place to start maybe is to uh, define the word addiction. Addiction, the root of the word comes from the Latin addictionum, and it meant an awarding or a devoting. So in ancient times, to be addicted to something was, maybe it's meant something that you loved. Maybe you could be addicted to playing the violin or to gardening or maybe to raising your family. It had a positive connotation a long time ago. Uh, much later, still maybe around 500 years ago, uh, it still had a positive connotation. It, it was a, a tendency of habits or pursuits, maybe gardening, maybe maybe you have a green thumb and you were addicted to gardening, something like that. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that the word started to have a negative connotation and specifically it started um, in reference to opium. So in the 30s, the US government gets involved with uh, trying to prohibit certain substances and marijuana was the first one. So this was a drug ad from the 30s to discourage marijuana use. This is pretty interesting. So marijuana with an H, it's a weed with the roots in hell, weird orgies, wild parties, and unleashed passions. Hmm, okay. I mean, that could incentivize use for some people. Um, and then it's got a, a syringe here. It looks like he's injecting her with cannabis. Uh, somehow, I'm not sure how that works. So in any event, I think we've come a long way since the 30s. Um, a present day definition that we could use for addiction, the compulsive and continued use of a substance or engagement in a behavior despite adverse consequences. Okay, addiction often involves tolerance, withdrawal symptoms upon discontinuation, and cycles of relapse and remission. So tolerance, we know it's just the need for increased amounts of the substance or increased engagement with the behavior to achieve the desired effect. We see that most prominently with opioids, but also with other, with really with all the substances, alcohol, methamphetamine also. Um, then withdrawal symptoms upon discontinuation, so stopping taking the substance or to, to cease engaging in the behavior leads to um, well-characterized withdrawal symptoms. So uh, the withdrawal syndromes for opioids is different than the withdrawal syn syndrome for alcohol, and that's different from the withdrawal sim uh, syndrome for stimulants. Um, but it's very well understood and predictable uh, withdrawal symptoms that come with the discontinuation of each substance. And then cycles of relapse and remission. So the disease concept of addiction really came about in this country in the 50s when the American Medical Association decided that alcoholism was an illness. Before that, it was viewed largely as a moral failing. But in the 50s, the, Amer the MA says, okay, it's an illness. And then in 1987, the AMA officially termed addiction as a disease. Okay, so what's a disease? So a disease is a structural or functional disorder of organ systems, which produces specific signs or symptoms, and which is not simply a direct result of a physiologic injury. So obviously having a sprained ankle is not a disease, right? But structural or functional disorder of organ systems, which produce specific signs or symptoms. So what's the primary organ system involved in addiction, in substance use disorders? Well, the primary one would be the central nervous system, our neurology. It's perhaps primarily a disease of thinking and feeling and of emotions and those sorts of things. Now, of course, continued use obviously affects other organ systems. It affects 
the gastrointestinal system, cirrhosis of the liver, gastric ulcers with alcohol, um, the pulmonary system, the lungs, with you know inhaling um, smoke, methamphetamine, crack, those sorts of things. Skin, obviously, is affected with uh, methamphetamine. Uh, our, our, our teeth. So a lot of organ systems eventually become impacted. Um, though it's primarily, I think, uh, fair to consider addictive disease as being a functional disorder of our central nervous system. So the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it's the standard text used by mental health professionals in the United States for classifying mental disorders. So psychiatrists, therapists, counselors um, use the DSM. And it's just, uh, if you've ever seen it, it uh, has the list of all recognized mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use disorders, um, all sorts of things. So the current version of DSM is DSM-5. The previous one was DSM-4, and the substance use disorders used to be broken into two distinct entities. There was substance abuse and substance dependence. And substance abuse was the earlier, less severe manifestation of a substance use disorder. And substance dependence was the more severe manifestation of substance use disorder. So you could have alcohol abuse, and then the more severe form would be alcohol dependence, or opioid abuse and opioid dependence. But now DSM-5 just combines it into a single disorder, so it's just alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, stimulant use disorder, benzodiazepine use disorder. And then that is uh, further broken down into three different, um, a, a continuum with three different um, degrees of severity. So mild, moderate, and severe. So now you can have alcohol use disorder mild, alcohol use disorder moderate, alcohol use disorder severe. So that's the current classification system. So within the DSM-5, all substance use disorders are based on the presence or absence of 11 criteria. So for every single substance use disorder, alcohol, opioids, stimulants, benzos, doesn't matter, they're the same 11 criteria. These 11 criteria are impairments in four distinct areas. Impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacologic dependence. To diagnose a substance use disorder, mild, moderate, or severe, depends upon how many of the criteria, how many of these 11 criteria are met. So someone who meets either two or three of the 11, and if alcohol is their their only drug of choice. If they meet two or three, then they would be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, mild. If they meet four or five of the 11, then they would be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, moderate. And if they met six or more of the 11, then they would be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, severe. Same thing goes with opiates. Opiate use disorder, mild, moderate, severe. Stimulant use disorder, mild, moderate, severe, etc. Okay, so here are the criteria. So the first group is the impaired control group. And the first one is taking more of a substance or taking it for a longer period than intended. The second impaired control criteria is, uh, is unsuccessful efforts to stop or cut down use. Obviously, that's a very common uh, occurrence for our clients. Um, the third one is spending a great deal of time obtaining, using, or recovering from use. And then the fourth criteria that's under impaired control is craving for a substance. And we'll talk a little bit more about craving in just a minute. The next grouping of criteria is the social impairment group. Uh, the first one is the failure to fulfill major obligations due to use, family obligations, job obligations, legal obligations, those sorts of things. Continued use despite problems caused or exacerbated by use. And that can be physical uh, men, uh, medical issues, psychiatric issues, financial issues. Uh, the third social impairment criteria is important activities given up or reduced because of substance use. 
and it makes sense, pe you know, family activities, hobbies that someone used to be interested in uh, are reduced or given up due to the use. Um, the next group is the risky use group, um, recurrent use in hazardous situations. So uh, driving while intoxicated, um, using in environments that are um, given to violence, um, I would say that IV use is by definition a hazardous thing to do, so I, that would uh, be included there. Um, also continued use despite physical or psychological problems that are caused or exacerbated by substance use. That's similar to um, one of the ones we just talked about. Continued use despite medical and psychological issues. I think maybe if we go back here, um, continued use despite problems caused or exacerbated by use, that might have more to do with uh, like legal um, issues and uh, financial issues and that sort of thing. Um, and then the last one is uh, the last uh, criteria group are, is uh, pharmacologic dependence, which we've already talked about this, tolerance and withdrawal. So um, yeah, anyone that has to use increasing amounts of a substance to achieve the same effects uh, has tolerance. And then uh, the withdrawal symptoms, again, they're substance specific um, and they onset when using, when not using, or when just using less than they normally do. So a definition of craving. So craving, it's a, a broad range of phenomenon which include the anticipation of a drug's effects, the intention to engage in drug use, and then intense pulsatile desire to use the drug. And so pulsatile just means that craving tends to come in waves tends to be very intense for a short period of time. And if it's not acted upon, it may diminish. It may, it may not, but it tends to come in waves. So the anticipation, the intention, the preoccupation, thinking about it, thinking about using, thinking about how you're going to use, how you're going to get money to use, and then this intense waves of desire that overcome individuals. Um, one of the things about craving is that it can operate independently of conscious awareness. So as powerful as it is, it can be considered almost like a hostile takeover of our psychology, this intense desire to use a drug. But it's, it can be, at the same time, it can be outside of our awareness. It's so overwhelming that it, it, to call it a hostile takeover is one way to describe it. It just really completely overwhelms the psychology and the, um, the mental activity of an individual. So the, the craving is just so powerful that it's outside of conscious awareness. If you were, if you just had a kind of a, a, a craving to eat a donut, it, it may not overwhelm you. Um, but a craving to use a substance, particularly the, the opioids, I, I would say, and well, really all of them, alcohol stimulants, all of them can just be so overwhelming that, um, there's just an utter lack of insight. It's just such a powerful drive. So we'll change gears a little bit and talk about the biology of substance use disorder, the neurophysiology. We've already said that the central nervous system is the primary organ, sy organ system that is affected by substance use disorders. And within that, there's the brain reward pathway, the BRP. And that's a collection of highly interconnected centers, which in the brain, which function in a coordinated manner to promote human survival by rewarding behaviors necessary for continued survival. So a group of different, though connected, centers in the brain that function in a coordinated manner, they're all communicating, to promote survival by rewarding behaviors necessary for continued survival. So that was the initial, and this is a very primitive part of our brain. And one way to think about it, this is a simple way to think about it, is that anything that promoted survival in our ancestors 100,000 years ago would be, would utilize this brain reward pathway. Um, the pro, neurotransmitters are chemical messengers inside the brain that, um, that brain neurons use to communicate with other neurons. There's serotonin, there's norepinephrine, 
Um, there's GABA, there's a bunch of them, but dopamine is one of the primary ones. The primary neurotransmitter of the brain reward pathway is dopamine. So let's go back 100,000 years ago when there was a behavior that was engaged in that promoted survival, a little bit of dopamine would be released within this brain reward pathway. So something like uh, getting a, a fatty meal, a high calorie meal, 100,000 years ago, it was hard to do that. You couldn't just go to the grocery store. So having a very high fat or high carbohydrate meal would release dopamine in the brain, within the brain reward pathway. And that would motivate one to repeat that. Um, just being in your tribe, being in a safe tribe, sitting around a fire, that sort of thing, that would promote survival. So it would release a little bit of dopamine. And then just the, 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 the motivation to reproduce. Sexuality also releases dopamine. Having an orgasm releases dopamine. And that promotes survival of the whole species. So the brain reward pathway, it's not ours in a sense. It's not personal to us. Every human has it. Every human wants to eat food. Every human wants to drink when they're thirsty. And every human wants to feel safe. And to one degree or another, I mean, reproduction is a, you know, I mean, not every single person, but generally speaking, as a species, species are driven to reproduce. And so the brain reward pathway is a way that the body compels us to repeat behaviors that promote survival, and dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter that's employed. Uh, employed. So just to be a little bit more specific, within the brain, I said there's a bunch of interconnected centers. One of them is the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, and one of them is the nucleus accumbens. When a behavior that will promote survival, whether that's eating a fatty meal or a high carbohydrate meal or feeling safe sitting around the fire or, um, or sexual intercourse, having an orgasm, these are all things that release dopamine and the neurons originate in the VTA and then they dump the dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. So again, 100,000 years ago, uh, one of our ancestors eats a fatty meal and dopamine goes from the VTA and gets dumped into the nucleus accumbens. And that causes, in a sense, a memory to be formed, a deep kind of primal memory in our brain that will compel us to repeat that. Hey, eating that honey out of the beehive was good. And so dopamine is released and it's going to compel us to repeat it later. Eating that fatty meal, feeling safe. So this is the primitive system in our brain, the brain reward pathway, anything that promotes our survival. The problem is that drugs of abuse hijack that system and also dump dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, but they dump a far greater amount of dopamine. So eating some honey or eating a fatty meal or sitting around the fire or having sex, it releases dopamine, but it's nowhere near the amount of dopamine that methamphetamine, for instance, you, uh, releases into the nucleus accumbens. So these, these drugs of abuse have hijacked this primitive and essential system in our brain, which then functions to compel us to repeat these same behaviors over and over and over again. This, it's an oversimplification, but that's basically, well, that's what I want to get across. The brain reward pathway is essential, and these drugs of abuse have hijacked it. Okay, so we've talked about this. So the nucleus accumbens right down here at the bottom, that's where this dopamine gets released. If you smoke crack, if you smoke meth, if you shoot heroin, dopamine gets released in the nucleus accumbens. But these, as we said before, these centers are all connected. There's a bunch of them that are involved, and they're all connected to each other. The prefrontal cortex... Um, the VTA, we talked about that, um, the hippocampus. So if you affect one of these interconnected centers, you're affecting all of them. If the nucleus accumbens is affected, and it is, it has a, a huge amount of dopamine 
all of a sudden dumped into it, then every other center that's connected to that will also be affected. And that's kind of where the problem comes in. And this, this just illustrates the same thing, that there are a lot of centers in the brain, they're all communicating with each other. So we're just going to talk about four of the main ones. There are more of them, but just remember, all these centers are connected. Someone uses a drug of abuse. It releases dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, and then the nucleus accumbens is connected to the next four centers we're gonna talk about here. And so now they've been affected. The first one is the prefrontal cortex. It plays a central role in um, executive functioning, learning, working memory, flexibility of response, processing speed. Some of the skills of the prefrontal cortex include reasoning, impulse control, and perseverance. So if the nucleus accumbens has been affected and the nucleus accumbens impacts the prefrontal cortex, then it makes sense that someone's ability to reason, to use good judgment, to demonstrate impulse control, to have perseverance would also be impacted. So you're affecting those capacities, right? Something like impulse control, I mean, it's essential for addiction and for, and for not becoming addicted. Um, perseverance. Getting sober early on is very challenging and, and it takes perseverance. It takes stamina. And if that system has been impacted, then maybe someone doesn't have the same amount of perseverance as someone who had never used substances in the past. Okay, another center that's important is the amygdala. Now the amygdala is a kind of a primitive center in the brain and it's, it, it does a number of things, but one thing is it sort of scans for danger. It's a part of our brain that's just making sure we're safe. It's examining the environment, make sure it doesn't see any bears or any threats. It's also involved with regulating our emotions and it gives an emotional context to our memories. So there's a different center in our brain, which we'll talk about the hippocampus, which just sort of remembers factual things. But the amygdala is involved with emotional memories. People that have PTSD have overactive amygdalas. Their amygdalas are hypervigilant. They're always on guard for danger. The amygdala is tied into this brain reward pathway. And so if someone had an overactive amygdala, if they had PTSD, they might be more inclined to seek relief by engaging in behaviors that dump dopamine which is inherently pleasurable into the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so again, I'm just trying. I, I'm, I'm not trying to to make this too complicated, but I just want you to to try to keep in mind that these centers are all connected. When you impact one, you impact all of them. And if someone had something like PTSD, they may be more likely to seek out pleasurable behaviors. Uh, to give them relief. And if someone had been using substances for a long time, they might have impairments of impulse control and reasoning and that sort of thing. Another center is the hippocampus. The hippocampus was thought for a long time to be the center where factual memory is stored. You know, your birth date, um, you know, uh, dates, the uh, names, those sorts of things. But actually the hippocampus does a lot more than that and it, and it contributes to our ability to form relationships with others. It affects our judgment and allows us to have flexible cognition. So again, if the whole system, if the, all these centers are influencing each other, and if there's an imbalance in one part in the nucleus accumbens, there's way too much dopamine being dumped over and over into the nucleus accumbens, then you can see how it also would impact the hippocampus, and that would impact our judgment. It might give us an impairment of our ability to have flexible cognition. Flexible cognition just means the ability to respond in different ways, in nuanced ways. But with addictive behavior, that's not what we see. We see the same thing over and over and over and over. There's an inflexibility in cognition. They're just stuck in this same rut, making the same choices over and over again. The last center, there are others, but the last center I want to talk about, the anterior cingulate cortex has been involved with empathy, with impulse control, and with decision-making. So the same thing. When one part is affected, it's all affected. So if the anterior cingulate cortex 
is not functioning optimally, then there's going to be more trouble with impulse control. Decision making will be poor. And empathy is important. You know, empathy um, might allow one to see how one's behavior is impacting others. But when someone's just stuck in, in substance use disorder, when the, the empathy isn't there, they just, you know, they feel so isolated and they're unable to, uh, to see that they might be harming other people, their family and their loved ones. And also, and it would, it would also predispose one, someone to possibly victimizing someone else, you know, in, in selling drugs. And I'm not trying to be judgmental about it, but just, you know, judgment, empathy, connecting with others, feeling safe. All of these things are part of the brain reward pathway, and they're all affected when there's an imbalance. And using substances of abuse day after day after month after year contributes to a worsening imbalance over time of the brain reward pathway. So we talked about this before, um, how survival behaviors are made memorable by the brain reward pathway, eating a fatty meal, feeling safe in your tribe. It releases just a little bit of dopamine. If you look all the way on the left, uh, the food, you know, it's a tiny bit of dopamine compared to methamphetamine on the right. There's no way that just the simple activities which support our survival, eating, sex, feeling safe in a community, can compete with methamphetamine and crack and heroin. The, the amplitude, the degree of the dopamine dump far exceeds any kind of normal survival behaviors. So that's why these drugs, they just overwhelm and hijack the system. And you can see if that brain reward pathway was, was designed to have us repeat behaviors and the neurotransmitter that it uses is dopamine, and that makes these behaviors memorable and makes us want to repeat them again, you can see why someone would repeat these drug seeking behaviors over and over and over again because the amount of dopamine is is extreme compared to what we would just uh, what would occur naturally so shift gears again to some of the behavioral components of substance use disorder so reinforcement refers to the tendency of certain stimuli to strengthen learn learned stimulus response tendencies uh, a reward is a type of reinforcement, it's an aspect of reinforcement, and those are uh, pleasurable stimuli which have the property of eliciting seeking behaviors. So there's, there's negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. We'll, we'll talk about them both. Rewards are, by definition, positive reinforcement because they're, they're pleasurable. So positive reinforcement occurs when a stimulus is presented as a consequence of a behavior and the behavior increases. So a non-SUD example is you knock on a door and no one answers, and then you ring the doorbell and someone answers. So the next time, you'll probably just press the doorbell first because that is what gave you the response that you were looking for. In terms of substance use disorders, like positive reinforcement is drinking alcohol increases so socialization. You feel less anxious and you're able to talk and laugh and dance and those sorts of things. Uh, feeling artistically inspired after taking a hallucinogen or cannabis, something like that. The euphoria that comes from taking prescription medications, opioids, uh, a non-prescription opioids, heroin. Uh, feeling calm and relaxed when taking benzos. Feeling high energy and focused after taking stimulants. A lot of people are treating their ADHD with, um, with methamphetamine particularly. So those are all the positive reinforcements that underlie substance use disorder. You know, the negative reinforcements, the removal of something unpleasant. So with positive reinforcements, there's the addition of something pleasant. With negative reinforcement, the removal of something unpleasant to increase the frequency of a behavior. So a good example is the loud buzz in the car. When you get in, you turn on the ignition, there's a buzz, and once you put on the seatbelt, the buzz, the buzz stops. So the buzz is, a, is obnoxious. We don't like it. And it's removed when we do a certain thing. So that makes it more likely that we will put our seatbelt on because we like when that buzz stops. So the negative reinforcements 
uh, that underlie substance use disorder. One is using alcohol to remove anxiety. Um, depression is removed when someone uses a substance often. Um, inattention and feeling distracted is removed when someone uses stimulants. So I'm just trying, again, just trying to, to have a holistic picture of what's going on with addiction. There is the, the actual physiology, all of the dopamine that's being dumped into the, the brain reward pathway. And it's hard to overcome that because it's such a powerful and primitive part of our, um, of our neurobiology. So all that dopamine is being dumped in when we're using substances. And then there are all these behavioral aspects. Day after day, after week, after year, after month, we have positive reinforcements. Um, you know, we, uh, the, uh, we have negative reinforcements. The depression goes away. The anxiety goes away. The positive reinforcements, the euphoria comes on. We, we, we increase our socialization. We feel creative. So there's so many um, psychological uh, reinforcers that are going on with substance use. Another thing is called incentive salience. And that's a type of motivation created in the brain um, through an association between a stimuli and a reward. It's similar to a positive um, it's similar to a positive reinforcement, but the thing is, so incentive, just something that motivates someone, but salient just means important. Incentive salience with substance use disorders, what it really means is that, why it's important is that certain peripheral events to substance use become overly important. Certain peripheral events and, and cues, certain rituals involved with substance use always also start to release dopamine on their own. That's essentially what the incentive salience theory really means. So we know if someone smokes meth or shoots heroin or drinks alcohol, that they release dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. We know that. But the other behavioral aspects of substance use on their own also begin to release dopamine. So just driving into the neighborhood where you score your drugs also releases dopamine. Driving by the liquor store where you buy your liquor releases dopamine. Just seeing a syringe or a rolled up dollar bill, all of these things which are to someone else would be neutral. Someone else who doesn't have a substance use disorder, they could drive past your the bar you go to or see a syringe and they may have a negative association with it but it's just another complexity to all of this that these peripheral events and the rituals also release dopamine and it becomes even more reinforcing another term that we hear is euphoric recall it's a psychological term for the tendency of people to remember past events in a positive light while overlooking the negative experiences and again, it's a potent psychological aspect of substance use disorders. You know, getting arrested, the um, losses of, of friendships and families and all sorts of things. Um, not all the time, but some of the time, they're not seen with the same degree of clarity that the positive aspects that people uh, think they're gaining from using substances, you know, the feeling connected and the release from tension and anxiety and fear and those sorts of things. So your fort recall is just sort of an imbalance and um, not is minimizing the negatives and overestimating or glamorizing the, the positive aspects. Okay, again, just another mental psychological component to all of this. So we'll switch a little bit. When I was talking about epidemiology, just sort of um, just want to talk a little bit about the risk factors for substance use disorder. So in statistics, there's a simple measure called an odds ratio, and it measures the association between an exposure and an outcome. So the odds that an outcome will occur given a particular exposure. So an odds ratio, you can take two things and compare them and just see if there's a correlation, essentially. So an odds ratio equal to one means that the exposure doesn't, the exposure to one thing doesn't affect uh, the, the outcome one way or the other. If an odds ratio is greater than one, then exposure to one thing increases the likelihood that a particular thing will happen. 
if an odds ratio is less than one, then it actually decreases the likelihood that a particular outcome would happen. So just a simple example is like diabetes and heart disease. People with diabetes are, have an increased risk for heart disease. So the odds ratio of diabetes um, leading to heart disease is greater than one. We know that diabetes is a risk factor for heart disease. We know that. So there are other mental health conditions that are risk factors for substance use disorders, and we'll talk about those. So alcohol use disorder uh, specifically, uh, the prevalence is highest for men over women, uh, whites and Native Americans, uh, previously married or never married, um, and low income level. These are all risk factors to develop an alcohol use disorder. And as we see here, only about 20% of people are ever treated. So all these things are risk factors for alcohol use disorder. But there are other things that are risk factors for alcohol use disorder. Depression, bipolar, personality disorders, they all have odds ratios of greater than one. So they're all risk factors. If you have depression, you're at risk for also developing a substance use disorder. Other conditions, they have a little, it's a, it's a lesser association, but still panic disorders, specific phobias, generalized anxiety disorders are also uh, have odds ratios greater than, greater than one. So they're risk factors. Uh, drug use disorders, again, um, uh, being male is a risk factor. White Native American is a risk factor. Lower education, lower income. Uh, those are risk factors for a drug use disorder. And again, uh, you know, treatment is not nearly uh, what we would like it to be uh, in this country. So the same thing uh, we see um, with the mental health conditions, depression, PTSD, personality disorders, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, social phobia. These are all risk factors for developing substance use disorders. So the reason I want to bring this up is because, and, and I think everyone knows this, but just again, to have a holistic picture. You know, some of these things, it, it's interesting that lower socioeconomics and uh, unemployment. These are risk factors for substance use disorders. Depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD. So people that are suffering seek out relief. It's that simple. And this was demonstrated elegantly in a study that a lot of people are familiar with. If you are, just please bear with me. If you haven't, maybe this will be interesting to you. The Rat Park study by uh, a researcher named Bruce Alexander. He had a team of people, but he was kind of the main author. So the Rat Park study. In the 60s and the 70s, researchers were trying to determine the addictive properties of certain substances. And what the, in order to do that, what they did was they devised experiments where they would put rats in cages and give them access to morphine. There would be a paddle and well, more, it started off with morphine, but then alcohol and cocaine and other substances, there'd be a paddle and the rat could hit the paddle and self-administer these substances. And what they found was that when given a choice between morphine and food or morphine or uh, cocaine and food, that the rats would actually use these substances more frequently than to, to eat their food. There were, um, you know, they could have had both and they were choosing to use the substance over and over and over again. And to these researchers, what that showed was that how these substances are so addictive, these rats, when they have unlimited access to it, all they do is hit that paddle all day long so uh, they can have access to this addictive substance, morphine, alcohol, cocaine, whatever. Well, Dr. Alexander and his colleagues wondered about that and they they observed that these rats were in terrible conditions they were just in a cage all by themselves with nothing but some food and some morphine and yeah they were choosing morphine in those uh, situations but they to dr alexander and others they realized that these intolerable conditions that the rats were put in was likely what was causing them to seek relief in morphine and alcohol and cocaine, things like that. So they developed a different study. 
where they built a really nice environment for rats to live in called Rat Park. And uh, it had wheels and, and wood chips. And most importantly, it had other rats. And then they put, they gave them the same access to the substance, morphine and alcohol, whatever. And then they, they, they tried it again. And then they're observing line now. Now, how often are they hitting the paddles? How, much, how often are they self-administering drugs now where they have a much more a much more favorable a, a welcoming warm environment to live in and not surprisingly here's some pictures from rat park um not surprisingly the rats in rat park use the substances way less frequently than the rats that were in isolation in just a, a desolate cage all by themselves and so you know the the implications are obvious when they were in a community when there were fun things to do and there were other rats around, uh, they did. I think they did use it some, but it was nothing like the rats that were in solitary confinement. So the conclusion was it's, yeah, things like morphine and cocaine and alcohol, they do have potent effects on our neurochemistry, but the people that are at risk to develop dependencies on these are the people that are already suffering. They're lonely. They're victims of trauma. They don't have opportunity. They're impoverished. And they're in some sort of psychological and emotional pain. And they turn to these substances to, to diminish their pain. So the, the rats using all those substances was a response to the terrible conditions they were in rather than just some inherent um, property of these substances that would overwhelm anyone's psychology. Because that's not true. Because when we look around, we see people that can drink responsibly all the time. And there are people that use other substances responsibly. It's not every single person that becomes uh, dependent on alcohol or, um, or opiates. But there are people that are absolutely vulnerable. And things like loneliness and isolation and trauma and emotional pain makes one vulnerable. He said that chronic isolation causes people to look for relief, um, allowing them to escape their feelings and to deaden their senses. And then they experience an addictive lifestyle, lifestyle as a substitute for the painful life that they, they're, they're escaping from. And you know, he talks about our society, this hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive, frantic, crisis-ridden society makes, makes most people feel socially and culturally isolated and puts a lot of people at risk for uh, needing to deaden the pain through substance use. So the Rat Park study was very influential to me. Uh, I have a friend named Michael and uh, we write songs together and we wrote a song about Rat Park and I'd like to share it with you. <laughs> 
Okay, everyone, I do appreciate your time very much, and uh, I hope that this was helpful to you. And um, yeah, you're um, welcome to try to get in touch with me and uh, if you want to discuss any aspects of this. Okay, thanks a bunch for your time. Wish you the best. Bye-bye.